Hello, everybody. My name is Jason Sosa. I am the founder and CEO of Immersive, I-M-R-S-V. So uh, I think as she was saying, we can't afford vowels as startups, so we have to figure out how we can get these domains in there. I'm gonna to talk to you today about uh, face technologies. And there is a lot of words that are out there that describe these different types of face technologies, everything from face recognition to facial coding to tracking and all this other stuff. And so I want to make sense of a rather misunderstood technology. So for years, uh, if you can go ahead and play that, that clip. So facial recognition has been a staple of science fiction films for years. And you've probably seen it in Minority Report, Terminator, uh, CSI, and others. And there's this bounding box that surrounds people's faces. And usually big, uh, images of Big Brother come to mind, or tracking technology, surveillance. And a lot of the thoughts that we have about this type of technology largely comes from the things that we see in Hollywood films. In this clip is a, a version of the matrix that we ran using our software that is actually identifying faces throughout the, the uh, video film. So in his book, uh, Jeff Jarvis says that what we're experiencing now is a way to negotiate new norms for our new reality, and that this is hardly the first time. So the first public privacy discussion around uh, this type of camera technology began in the 1890s with the invention of the portable Kodak camera. And this led to the uh, New York Times decrying these fiendish Kodakers that were lying in wait. And President Teddy Roosevelt outlawed these uh, cameras in Washington parks for a time. And legislators were ready to require opt-in permission for somebody that simply wanted to take your picture. So we've come a long way since then. But for the last few years, we've been studying both the technical and social impact of what a computer vision equipped world means. And so we've interviewed people from all walks of life and have really come down to the conclusion that people really see this technology like it's magic. Like it's like a black box of algorithms. And there are usually two words that come up to describe this kind of tech. The first word is that it's cool. And the second word is that it's creepy. Arthur C. Clarke says that magic is just science that we don't understand yet. So this isn't magic, it is science, and it's not usually just one capability. It's not just face recognition and kind of lumped into these uh, kind of categories. It's really multiple things. There's usually multiple algorithms that work together to come up with a capability uh, for this technology. So uh, everything from using it to determine gender, age, uh, emotions, recognition. But let's start by separating the, the Hollywood hype from the reality of, of what the real science is. So face detection works by looking at a frame of video or an image. And what happens is it starts by scanning uh, the image and it looks for a pattern, a very specific pattern of the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, because that's very universal to human beings. And when it finds that face, it identifies it. But it, the hard part about this is it has to identify it uniquely behind things that might look like a face like a hubcap, or uh, the background of maybe this wallpaper here. Probably, if you look really carefully, you might actually see a face. And so it's really difficult for a computer algorithm to be able to determine the difference between the two. And there are usually multiple steps in identifying these types of faces and what they can actually do. So there's several combinations here about uh, how you would do things. The first thing is it wants to find a face. Once the computer vision algorithm can track a face, the next thing it needs to do is it needs to follow that face so that it can distinguish between multiple users, so that it can account for occlusion, people walking in front of or behind each other. And then the next step is understanding that face. Maybe it's the emotions. Maybe it's classifying based on gender or age or understanding the engagement time of how long that person was there. After that, the next step is unique IDs, which is recognition. So usually when we talk about face recognition, we're talking about all these capabilities kind of lumped into one, but there's usually multiple steps before you can actually get to that final phase of, of recognition. So there's many different methods and combinations with it, and there are usually trade-offs when you have to combine these technologies. So at the moment, we're living in two worlds. And I'm not sure about you, but I spend a majority of my time in this digital world, and occasionally visit the real world that we all are a part of. So what we're seeing now is a rise in cameras, and these cameras are everywhere. 
there are in 1.2 billion devices, and this number is taken from uh, devices like laptops, mobile devices, tablets, and it's going to be in increasing, as, as we know, through things like Google Glass. Um, if you look at the latest Samsung TVs, a majority of them have cameras built into them. And we're seeing them more and more in physical spaces, using as sensors in vehicles, uh, in, in retail analytics, in a number of different places. So what we're seeing is the rise of computational power and uh, the rise and the decreased cost of these sensors because they're being now uh, ubiquitously distributed amongst all these different types of devices. Between the online and the real world, the online world has an advantage in that you can measure conversion rates, you can measure click-throughs, uniques, you can measure the time spent, and these tools are automated. It's continuous, it's real-time data, and these capabilities enable you to do things like personalized content, adaptive uh, uh, messages that you see when you visit a website, like on Facebook. But the real world, we have largely antiquated methods. You basically have a person with a clipboard as one method to go and measure these real world spaces. It is a snapshot in time, not continuous data. And that's a real problem. It's real challenging because the cost to distribute this is, is very high if you want to do this at scale. So the real world today is really where the internet was back in 1999. It's a noisy place full of advertisements, it's irrelevant messages, it's long wait times, and it's usually a poor customer experience. If you look at the, in order to change these things, what we really need to have is a real world actionable data system. And for that, for that fact, uh, face tech is one means by which we have that capability. So the real world has advantages that the online world doesn't have in that it provides direct engagement, emotions, group dynamics, real-time continuous information. So if you could play this clip, this is actually uh, in our labs in New York City, we've been experimenting with feature point detection and emotions. And for decades, this type of technology has been slow and incremental. But really over the last few years, we've seen this huge rise in capability because of you know, the adoption of smartphones and decreased cost of sensors. So we think that now we're at a tipping point where this type of technology is becoming mainstream. Already it's embedded in probably 30% of the phones that are in this room today. It's astounding to think that there are already 20 million face and voice recognition sensors that sit inside of people's living rooms. And this number is gonna be increasing, especially with the adoption of the new Xbox, which will have always on camera connections and internet connections. So we're seeing a rise in these types of technologies and tools, so it's, it's probably best for us to at least understand what they are, how they work, and how they play a part in our lives. So here are just a couple examples of what's possible. Once you have this data, what can you do with it? Well, the first thing is you can use this kind of information to trigger real-time events. So like on the web, when you visit a website, the content can change dynamically for you. Well, that can happen also in the real world. So if a camera is embedded into a display, it can now know your age, your gender, your attention time, how many glances. It can look and say, given that there's three women and two men, what ad should I display? And it can pick the right one for that moment in time. The other thing is being able to use it for real world analytics. Placing a sensor, uh, such as a small web camera, on an end cap, a shelf, a doorway entrance, a vending machine, anything that you want to measure in real time and understand how are people engaging with this space. It's micro level data. So here's an example of this application running. This is an application called uh, Car Player. It is using real-time face detection tracking. Now this is not recognition. This is using face detection. It's simply understanding the age, the gender, the attention time. And with that, it's able to change these ads dynamically. Every single ad up here has a relevancy score that was assigned to it based on weighted values. So what I did is said, this Bud Light ad is probably gonna lean more male, or this uh, Clinique ad is probably gonna lean more female. When a female approaches, let's change the ad. And you can see how it's working now in uh, doing that with these, uh, these advertisements. 
The cool thing is that now this is all available on the web. The same way you get with real-time data for a website, you can now have that for a physical space or multiple spaces. You could sit at your desk, you could see all the information coming in from all these physical locations in real time. And you can filter. Let's say we only want to see young adult females. Or we want to see reports on it based on the age groups or based on the installation. So there's a lot of different things you could do with this. One cool thing we did with this, it was actually working with ad tech. We did this uh, really interesting thing where we were measuring an entire space. And we had six locations set up. And we were actually able to measure the attention time and engagement level of people in these different spaces. And then we tweeted out automated data, like how many men are at this, uh, you know, this, the registration, or how many women are here, or what's the average attention time. So it was a pretty cool way to engage social media using this type of technology. One of the things we did also was work with PepsiCo at, uh, at South by Southwest. We did some pretty cool stuff where we had six screens set up uh, that were letting people see themselves in the ad. So we, have, we started out just by measuring random ads. We just looped them and to see what the attention time was going to be. The next step was to adapt those ads based on age and gender. And we saw a 60% increase in attention time. Then we thought, well, what would it be like if we let people be a part of the ad? So we let them see themselves interacting with the advertisement. And it started out with an average attention time of one second, because people typically just kind of walked by. But when we let them be a part of the ad, it jumped to 11 seconds. And we had people waiting in line. And they were taking pictures. And they were tweeting it. And within five days, we were able to measure more than uh, almost 44,000, 45,000 people in that space. So it was a pretty cool way to see what would happen if you take these methodologies of the web and bring them to a real world space. In addition, able to see the most popular hours per day and, and all these other things. So it was, it was a really cool way to see how this information uh, applied to the real world. Now, it's almost impossible to talk about this technology without talking about privacy. So the FTC, this last December, uh, put together some guidelines on what's called privacy by design. Now, this is basically stating that you don't need to use facial recognition in the sense I'm identifying somebody individually to have this technology be useful. So we've built our technology that, in a way that doesn't record video, it doesn't transmit it anywhere, it doesn't save any pictures, there's no personal information, doesn't know that I'm Jason. So when our software looks at me, it just knows I'm a young adult male. And we securely encrypt all the data. And we quickly went out and we were proactive. We met with privacy advocates and said, what do you think about this? How, how would this, what would this be like if this was in a physical place? Would you have any objections to this? And as long as we follow the mandates of the FTC, which are just posting a notice stating that this technology is uh, being used, there were no problems. And one of the things that we also really decided early on was that you could either be a security company or you could do everything else. And we opted to do everything else. We think this is a tool that can be used for perceptive computing and new ways of interacting with machines, especially as now computers can understand our emotions. It really opens up some new doors. So like it or not, uh, once was once science fiction is now quickly turning into a reality. And in the near future, the analytics that you have on the web will now be available for you in real world spaces. So if you wanted to know how effective an end cap was or how effective a specific uh, uh, product display was, you can have that information to you in real time. And you'll be able to see an overview of traffic from multiple locations. So the use of real estate will be um, even more efficient, especially as these big box stores start to shrink down their footprint. So environments could someday respond to your presence. Forget the need to have an app at all. What if the interface was gone? What if it was, you, uh, an example of it is maybe you walk into a Starbucks, and you simply uh, give that Starbucks permission to pay with your face, or you pay just by your presence. And now for us, that's a really bizarre notion, but if you think back maybe 10, 15 years ago, to where we were and what we're using today with geolocation and Facebook and Foursquare and everything else, it's not that far off. So there are a lot of things that need to come into play, some standards on privacy protections, opt-in permission, uh, a lot of things that are part of that. But this technology is uh, quickly changing the way we're able to collect data and able to measure that and contrast that with the kind of information that we see in physical spaces. And I am right on time.
Very good. Thank you very much. Is there a Q&A? Great. Um, I think, I will, do we have time for a Q&A? For a couple questions? Yeah. Excellent. All right, so very good. Questions? Yes. Um, I was glad that you touched on privacy because obviously that would be one of the main concerns of, right. of this technology going mainstream. But uh, um, it's still, uh, I mean, the fact that no images are recorded is, is great. But um, I was thinking, or it brought me back to um, the, when Google uh, filters the stuff that we search for, and that's called the, fil the filter bubble. And a lot of people are not even aware of this. So, how do you sense this is going to go in terms of uh, the tension that some people may feel about the right content being pushed to them just because of what the algorithms think that they should see versus just what's happening today? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have this question a lot. Just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I want to see female ads. Just because I'm a man doesn't mean I want to see male ads. So our, our system works uh, a bit differently with the web. So the web, you have a one-to-one -one interaction. In the real world, you have one to many. So what an advertiser can do is actually set a weighted value to say, given that there are three women and two men, let's, and let's look at maybe age is the most important attribute. May not even be gender. Maybe it's the weather. Or maybe it's um, some other variable that they can take into account. So it's not always just going to base it on just one thing. It's not going to say these ads are just for male or female. Uh, it could be that they base it on a number of different things. So it could be that there's, uh, the, the crowd dictates the advertisement much more than on a one-to-one -one level. Does, does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason.